morning, everyone. Welcome to Villarica Christian Church. For those of you at home, a uh, great big welcome as well. Thanks for joining us today. A couple of announcements. Just look in your bulletin. If you haven't filled out the response card here with your information, do that so we can update our records. Also, we are about almost halfway to our goal for the summer lunch program. That's coming up two weeks from today, so let's get busy and meet that goal. Two weeks from today, we will meet here right after church, pack and deliver these boxes of food to children in the community. And also, this afternoon, 3 o'clock, we are having a cookout here at church. We hope you'll join us. But right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us, O oh Lord, and we thank you that we live in a free country where we can come together to worship in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that today as we gather here and as those folks who are at home gather around their televisions and their computers to watch, Father, I just pray that the words of our lips, the sounds of our voices, and the works of our hands would be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Help us to always remember that we are brothers and sisters in Christ because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every one of us. And all God's people said, Amen. Your spirit here with me. I 
have a faith that can't be shaken. I have a joy that can't be taken. I have a hope that can't be taken. No. I have your spirit here with me. I have a faith that can't be shaken. I have a joy that can't be tamed. What more could I gain? I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord in. see the Lord. Oh, I, I will see the Lord. You give us strength to face the battle. You give us life beyond the grave. You give us freedom now forever. You give us all eternity, and what more could I gain? I will see the Lord, I will see the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the Lord, I will see the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord in the land of the living. Oh, I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord. I will see the Lord in the land of the living. Oh, I, I will see. fiercest fight ever still my soul will cry I fear no evil even when I have no hope even when they throw the stones ever still my soul will know I fear no evil even in the darkest night even in the fiercest fight ever still my soul will cry
that you are that shining light, that hope, that shelter in the storm, Father. You are the one that we can find our comfort and our peace with the continuing promise that we will one day be with you forever. We thank you for this, Father. time of communion that we are about to have. The early church in Corinth had a little bit of an issue with communion. They weren't doing it quite right, and uh, Paul kind of laid it out in a very plain and easy to understand way that goes like this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Did you ever think about that, that we're proclaiming the Lord's death here? And we're really doing two things. We're remembering and we are proclaiming his death. And at the same time, we understand that every moment of every day, we are proclaiming the fact that he will come again. Wouldn't have been possible without him going to the cross. Let's thank him. Father God, thank you so much for this moment where we can just remember, where we can proclaim the death of your son, where we can proclaim our hope of eternal life that couldn't have happened without the most perfect sacrifice in your son. And so, Father, as we partake this morning, we pray that we would do so with remembrance, with unity, with awe, and with thankfulness. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
pray The sun and moon from balcony Turn their head in disbelief The precious love would taste the steam Disfigured and despair Friday a thief Sunday a king Born of the slain, the man Jesus Christ lay death in his grave. Oh, oh. sending your son to die on the cross for us so we can have and we can attain that hope that shining light that is within we thank you for this Lord we pray that our hearts and minds are open to the word this morning and it's in your name we pray Amen. good to see everyone here today if you would, open your Bibles up to the book of James. We're going to be taking a look at the second chapter. How many of y'all, when you turn on the news and you look at what's going on in the world today, you think the world's just gone plumb crazy? I mean, we've experienced, I said it today during our prayer time, what we've been going through with the shutdown and the COVID-19, I don't remember anything like it in my 56 years. And uh, I don't know, some of you folks have got a couple years on me. Do y'all remember anything as chaotic as what we've gone through? The heads I'm seeing right now are shaking no. So, life does that sometimes, though. 
James is writing to the church there. We're going to read the first 13 verses, so let's take a look at that. James chapter 2, starting with verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here, here has a, here's a seat. Here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, and you are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker, as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James is writing to the church there. Evidently, there was some, some uh, strife within the congregation there. There was favoritism being shown. Some might phrase that today as the haves and the have-nots. You know, when I read this passage, my first thought is the least of these. Throughout the gospel, Jesus tells us to reach out and to serve the least of these, to humble ourselves, and he'll lift us up. He's writing about favoritism based upon wealth, and he makes no bones about it. He says it is a sin. He's not saying being wealthy is a sin. He's saying showing favoritism based on wealth is a sin. Here he talks about a poor man who's being treated differently when he walks through the doors of the congregation, into the synagogue, the church, the temple, wherever it may be. Those who have are being shown favoritism, and those who have not are being given, treated as second-class or third-class citizens. We've never seen that happen in our world, have we? I know I told you the story a while back of my, me and a friend showing up at a black tie affair and we were dressed much like I am today. Khakis and button down shirts and leather jackets. But in that instance, the MC treated us as if we were honored guests, which is what we should do with each and every person who walks through these doors. With each and every person we find standing in front of us, we don't treat them based on how they look or are dressed. Years ago, I had to uh, return some materials to Lowe's. And the da it was damaged when I bought it, and they marked it down, and I took it into the store. I'd been working all day. I was wearing camos and a, a T-shirt that had paint all over it, and I had a do-rag on my head to keep the sheet dust rock out of my hair. And I went in, and the manager gave me a hard time about the return. Well, I, ca I called the guy who sold it to me. He was a friend of mine, and he was a department head, and he came up, and he okayed it. As the manager started to turn off, this friend of mine said, oh, wait a minute, sir, wait a minute, called his boss back. He said, have you met the Reverend David Parrish? And the manager looked at me and looked me up and down because I looked more like a biker than I did a pastor at that point in time. And he greeted me and shook my hand and went on his way. And then my friend looked at me as we walked off toward the back store. He says, I love doing that to him. But are we ever guilty of judging people on their outward appearance? It, it, it comes naturally, and it, it's wrong. Think about some other cases of favoritism in the Bible. You remember Joseph in the coat of many colors? His father set him apart by that coat, and his brothers despised him because of it. His brothers would eventually, one would say, let's, let's take the coat, we'll kill our brother, and we'll, we'll dip the coat in some goat's blood, and we'll give it to Dad and say a wild animal got him. Well, one of the brothers spoke up. 
And instead of killing the brother, they sold him into slavery. It happens in families all the time. And it creates havoc and turmoil when it does. I've seen many, many families divided because one was the golden child, one was the favorite child, and the other, well, they're just there, you know, that's just so-and-so. It's called discrimination and favoritism. Verse 4 tells us, since favor, says favoritism is a sin, and it warns against discriminating in verse 4. James makes no bones about it. Favoritism and discrimination are a sin. Now, if we take that one step further, we look at it and we think, and we state, racism is also a sin. What is racism? It's simply favoritism shown because of someone's ethnic background, because of the color of someone's skin. And our country is dealing with some issues right now because of our history. Look, I'm speaking from a southern point of view because I, I was born and raised here in Georgia, and I have seen racism at its worst. Well, probably not at its worst, but I've seen racism in everyday life. It's discrimination based upon someone's background. Now, let me ask you this. Did anyone here choose your ethnicity? Did anyone here choose your skin color? Did anyone here choose the color of your eyes? Or did anyone here choose how tall or how short you were going to be? Or did anybody here choose your hair color? Well, wait a minute. Some of you ladies have got me on that one, I understand. And <laughs> Couple of you guys too, maybe. I know about, I've heard of Just for Men. Maybe y'all have used that as well. But the answer to all those questions, except for the last two, is no. We didn't choose where we were going to be born. We didn't choose what we were going to look like. We didn't choose the, our parents or our country. Now, when I mention our country, let me say I hope everybody's having a happy Fourth of July weekend. I believe our country is the best country in the world, but we still have issues we need to work through. And discrimination is nothing new. If we go back to the book of Acts in chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, we see that the Greek Jews were, widows were complaining because they didn't feel they were getting their fair share of the food distribution. They felt like the Hebrew widows were getting more. And so they complained. And the apostles decided that their main role was to pray and to preach and to teach. And so they picked seven men, and they appointed them. And this is where we get our picture of deacons from. And they appointed them to oversee the food distribution. Now, when we read that passage, was it, was it an overt act of discrimination? I don't know. But it was happening, evidently. And the apostles realized there was a problem, and they pointed, appointed some men to take care of that problem. Make no mistake about it. We have issues with race in our country. We, and it, it, it's not just a black and a white thing. Many years ago, I was in Hawaii, and I went to a cemetery, and there was a Christian section, and there was a Japanese section, and there was a Korean section. Some of that's based upon culture, because they have different funeral rites, different practices. But there again, there are a lot of and there's a lot of animosity between some of those groups as well for a lot of different reasons throughout history. Think about this for a minute. Isn't it strange how we as humans, we divide ourselves up? Hey, I'm a southerner. Hey, I'm a northerner. I'm from the east coast. I'm from the west coast. And it doesn't, it's not just an American thing. I mean, think about it. You've got Americans, Africans, Asians. And the list goes on down by country and region. We divide ourselves up by where we are living, where we were born. When I travel to New Jersey, people right away know I'm not from New York or New Jersey. I had a girl in a restaurant said, I love your accent, where are you from? And I looked at her and I said, Jersey. And of course we all laughed about it. But we tend to divide ourselves in so many ways. Think about this for a minute. Could you imagine a herd of horses separating themselves based on the color of their hide? Or a herd of cattle separating themselves by the, the uh, length of their horns or the curve of the horn? And I understand that birds of a feather flock together. But think about this. Today, even a, a hundred years or so since the last major wave of immigration from Europe in our major cities, we still have 
many, many ethnic neighborhoods and boroughs. There's five boroughs in New York, and there are at least 18 distinct ethnic neighborhoods. And I'm not knocking that. I understand that people tend to want to gather with people who have similar beliefs and similar culture. But sometimes when we do that, we put up walls and keep others out. You go to Chicago, you've got Polish town, Little Italy, Greek town, just to name a few. And then you have the South Side, which is economically depressed. And just about every major city in America has a thriving Chinatown. And they, it's a great place to go and to see and get a little taste of Chinese culture. But when every one of those groups came to America, there was some discrimination against them. The Irish were portrayed as fighting, drinking thugs. The Chinese were de described as untrustworthy. I'm not going to get into any of the names that were used that are slurs, but... Each group was looked down upon in some way. And think about this. Even, even those who are born in America, we have an overabundance of what I would call hyphenated Americans, African Americans, Italian Americans, Chinese Americans. You go on, the list goes on and on and on. Just another division that placed upon people in a label that tends to separate separate, and segregate. Well, my family came from France, and then England, and I don't consider myself a European-American. I'm an American. I'll tell you, there were seven brothers came over from Europe. At least one of them was a horse thief. That's in the past. That's his thing. That wasn't my thing. I'm just an American. But even before I'm an American, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And that should be something that unites us. There's a pastor by the name of Vodie Bauckham. He is a black pastor, and I've listened to him. His name's Vodie, V-O-D-Y, Bauckham, B-A-U-C-H-U-M. If you get a chance, look him up sometimes. But I heard him speak on race one time. And he was moving, he's an American, he was going to live in London for a while with a particular ministry and his dad calls him up. So this is a black father talking to an adult black son and he says, son, have you found an African American church there that you can join? And at that point, Bodie just started laughing. He says, why would there be an African American church in London? Kind of ironic, isn't it? But I would, I would encourage you to listen to him sometimes. He really gets right down to the point. He says that his blackness doesn't define him. It's his Christianity that makes him who he is. It's not my whiteness that defines me. It's my Christianity that makes me who I am. I happen to be an American, but I'm first and foremost a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, we've got a lot of different cultures. I understand that. I, I've grown up in a southern context, and you know what? Barbecue is about as southern as you can get, isn't it? And that's what we do. We cook out, we hang out at the lake, and we do those types of things. I can remember when I was stationed at Aberdeen, Maryland, a bunch of us, there were several guys from the south, and we went and bought steaks and headed down to the Chesapeake Bay, and some of the guys who grew up in that area went, really, y'all are cooking steaks at the bay? What about the shrimp and the crabs and all those things? Well, hey, you go get them. We'll throw it all on them. We'll cook it all, but, you know, steaks and burgers, that's what we do. We do barbecue. And so it was an experience. Being in the military, you meet people from all over and from every walk of life. And I'm not against celebrating our culture. But when we get right down to it, aren't we more alike than we are different? Don't all people have the same basic needs? I mean, we all have the physical needs of food and water and shelter. We all have the need to feel safe and secure in our homes and in our lives. We want to gather with others and have relationships that matter. We want to be appreciated. And when we meet all those needs, we begin to look for something that goes even further, a need or something, a purpose that's even greater than ourselves. I believe that is found in the person of Jesus Christ. 
And again, I'm not against celebrating heritage. But one thing that does bother me, man's ability to treat each other poorly, whether it be in words or deeds or in policies. I mean, from the time that Cain slayed Abel, we have been doing that. From the Pharaoh suppressing the Hebrews and putting their, throwing their baby sons into the river, Nile. We have figured out more ways to mistreat and to abuse and neglect one another throughout the ages. The only difference today is we've gotten much more sophisticated about it, and we can do it in much larger numbers. You remember in the New Testament, there was a gentleman by the name of Saul, and he sought to persecute the church, and he had a letter saying he could kill any Christians that he found along the way, or any followers of the way. And he had an encounter with the risen Lord, and suddenly Saul became Paul, and he began to share the word. As I said, we've just found more efficient ways to oppress and suppress one another. Think about South Africa and their former apartheid government, where the minority whites suppressed the majority of the country who were black. But then again, it's not just about color difference either. Think about the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia. Or go to Northern Ireland. You have the Irish Catholics and the Protestants. If we stood them side by side, you could never tell the difference between them looking at them. Or Rwanda and the genocide that took place there many years ago. Two tribes fighting one another, the Hutus and the Tutsis. In the movie Hotel Rwanda, there's a scene where there's some reporters who are filming and reporting on what's going on. They're sitting at the bar in a hotel lobby, and there's two young black women sitting beside them, and they ask them, what is this fighting and what is this killing all about? And they speak of the two tribes, and... The reporter looks and says, well, which one are you? And one of them says, I'm a, I'm a Hutu, and the other one says, I'm a, a Tutsi. And the two gentlemen are looking, they're going, I, for the life of me, can't see the difference. And then think about the Holocaust, where Hitler and his evil regime tried to wipe out the Jewish race. Many years ago, I stood on Diamond Head, walked to the top of the volcano. I was there with my adult son. It was about 10 years ago. And as we stood there, we were looking at you, and I turned around, and there were two Asian women talking to one another. Now, I grew up in the South. I was never around a lot of folks who were Asian, so at the time, I really couldn't tell what country someone was from by looking at them or from what people group. But as we were standing there, I noticed one Asian woman bent over to a little child that was about four years old, and she began to speak in what I recognized as Japanese. And the mother of that four-year-old child grabbed that child's arm and snatched him back violently. And she looked at the other woman who was still squatting and said, We're Korean, thank you. And my son said, What? And I said, Come on, walk, walk, walk away, walk away. He says, What's going on over there? And I began to explain to him how the Japanese people, starting in the early 30s, had oppressed and brutalized the Korean peninsula forcing many of their women into the brothels. I saw a 66-year-old grudge, a grudge that was older than either of the two women I was interacting with or watching. I saw that grudge flare, and I heard the anger and the hatred. And both voices, as I walked away, and they began to argue at each other. Sad when you get down to it. Now indulge me for a moment while I t tell you one more story that's going to bring this all back into the church and back towards Scripture. Many years ago, as I began to serve in a church, I, was, I found myself in a hallway between services. This church had a sandwich model, early service, Sunday school, and then a late service. And as I stood in that hallway, I found myself talking with two men who were about my age. We were probably all in our mid-30s at that time. And, and I can picture the one man for sure, and I could tell you his name, but I'm not going to. I don't remember who the other man was. But as we're standing there talking, this man's son ran up. And his son was about 12 years old. And he kind of interrupted. He says, hey, Dad, 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 Dad. Yes, yeah, son, what is it? He says, hey, Jesus was white, wasn't he? Got attention right away. His dad looks at him and says, yes. 
Jesus was white. Okay, Dad, what, what, say that in the Bible? Where does it say in the Bible? Well, son, it says it in the Bible. I don't know where, but, you know, go ask, go ask William over there. He can tell you where it's at. And off goes this 12-year-old with the idea that the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is white. I wish I'd spoke up at that point in time, but I was just so dumbstruck by what I'd witnessed that I did not say a word. I don't know whether he was speaking just out of pure ignorance, because if you look at pictures of Christ, you see him depicted in just about every imaginable race. See if we have a slide there. If you look behind me, you see the picture there on the top left. That's the one that my grandmother had hanging in her hallway. That's the Jesus I grew up seeing every time I went to Grandma's house. But if you look at those depictions, you'll see a couple that are black. And if you look at one on the bottom row there, bottom left, not all the way in the corner, but there's one there that's surely Asian. You see, we tend to depict our Savior in our own image. The scripture tells us we're made in his image, but when we depict him in art, and I'm sure you've all seen Renaissance art, where Mary's wearing the big collar and Renaissance-type dresses, and you see people with armor that looks like they're ready to go out and get on a horseback and joust and things of that nature. We've all done that. We have, in some way, created Christ in our own image when we should allow scripture to change us and recreate us in his image. And like I said, I don't know if this man spoke out of ignorance or out of racism, but I know what he spoke wasn't true. Jesus wasn't white. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a, of a young virgin from Nazareth. But let's be brutally honest for a moment when we take a look at history. Scripture's been used many, many times, taken out of context to support racism. There are those who uh, will try to support slavery and racism from Scripture, and it's just wrong. But folks have tried to, to uh, justify it with things such as the curse of Ham and the mark of Cain. They'll say the mark of Cain was dark skinned, and the scripture just does not say that. It doesn't support that view. In fact, the Bible speaks out against slavery very strongly. God didn't institute it, He doesn't support it. He simply spoke into the human context. Exodus 21 16 says this Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. I don't know that there's a stronger verse in the Bible that speaks against slavery and human trafficking and enslavement of human beings. God didn't institute it. He simply spoke to it. And then in Paul writes, Slaves obey your earthly masters. He writes that in Ephesians and in Colossians. Paul was not supporting that. He was simply saying, Obey your authorities. He was speaking into the context in which he saw around him. Now, our media is portraying our current situation as strictly a black and a white divide. And there is a racial element to it. But there's far more going on than that. There's poverty. There's crime. There's lack of opportunity. There's education. I've always said that with government, you tax what you want to discourage and you... Uh, subsidize what you want to encourage. In some ways, some of our policies encourage broken families. A uh, mother of a child can get more in government subsidies if she's not married than if she is. And whether we realize that or not, that subsidizes broken families. But there's so much going on. I mean, think about it for a minute. What if I took y'all, this group, and all you at home, 
And I divided us up based upon our height, our skin tone, our eye color, our facial hair. How many of y'all have blue eyes? Show hands real quick. Any blue-eyed people here? Those are my people, okay? All right, blue eyes rock, right? But what if we divided up that way, and the ones that looked most like me, I showed favoritism. Here, come and have a seat up here. Have a great seat. The rest of y'all, well, you know, grab a seat over there by the wall or in the back. Seems ridiculous, doesn't it? I can't imagine him separating people in that manner. But like I said, discrimination is nothing new. We see it throughout the scripture. We see that Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. We know how they looked down, the Jews looked down upon the Samaritans. And it was based upon their heritage, that they had intermarried with some of the local folks. In John chapter 4, we see that Jesus sits and talks. This is scandalous. He sat and talked with the Samaritan woman at the well in the, at midday. In Galatians 2, 11 through 13, Paul confronts Peter for his hypocrisy. See, Peter had gotten in the habit of eating with Gentiles, and he would do that regularly until some of the folks from Jerusalem came down. And then suddenly, when certain eyes were watching him, he said, I can't eat with y'all anymore. I'm going to go back over here and eat with them. Sounds kind of like the high school lunchroom, doesn't it? You want to eat with the cool crowd? But that's what Paul confronted him about. In fact, in Acts 10, Paul, uh, Peter had this vision. Acts 10, 13 through 15. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. See, he had had a vision of a sheep coming down from the heavens that had every kind of animals, and it went up, and it came down. Three times he saw it, and then it disappeared. But the Lord says, get up and eat. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Shortly after that, Peter is called to go to the house of Cornelius. This is in verse 28. And Peter said to them, You know it's against our law for a Jew to visit a person of another nation. Some, some passages will say Gentiles. But God has shown me I should not say that any man is unclean. For this reason I came as soon as you sent for me. And then in verse 34, Peter says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. In other words, God accepts all people who come to him seeking forgiveness. He seeks all, he seeks all people who come to him, not based on color, not based on race, not based on gender. He shows no favoritism. But see, this is not just a New Testament idea. In Exodus 12, 48 and 49, God made provisions for foreigners to become Jewish people, to join the Jewish race. Now, they had to do some things, circumcision, and all those things have been wiped out in the New Testament, and we come to God through Christ alone. Aren't you glad he opened it up for that? Look, we sit here today, we would be classified as Gentiles. We would be outside the family of God under the Old Testament law. So we've, we've made it clear that favoritism is a sin and racism is a sin. And then we have to ask, where does it come from? Like all men, like all evil that men do, it comes from the heart of men. Matthew 15, 19, Christ said, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. It comes from the hearts of men. Now, I'm going to, I, I paraphrase a quote here from a uh, Russian writer. He wrote this as he spent time in a Russian gulag. He had been sent there for political reasons, but I'm going to paraphrase, and I'd give you his name, but I would just butcher it anyway, so I'm just going to paraphrase what he said. In all of these, evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, lying, slander. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not quite to that quote yet. 
All these things come from Satan. They begin with Satan, and he plays them out in the hearts of men. So God's word clearly says favoritism is a sin. I've gone a little further and said that racism is a sin. And we've determined where that begins, in the hearts of men. So what do we do about racism? First of all, we have to acknowledge that it exists. You know, for the most of us, we can insulate ourselves in our worlds, in our work, in our homes, and never have to really deal with racism. I mean, in early America, the first settlers tried to enslave many of the Native American Indians. You know what? It just didn't work because the Indians knew the lay of the land better than we did, and they kept running off. And from the very beginning of America, slaves were brought in from Africa. It's just a fact. We have to acknowledge that. And this nation benefited from that labor. This nation was built on the backs of slaves. And even after it was abolished, there were many, many kinds of laws that oppressed and abused black Americans. We have to acknowledge it. Now, when I say we have to acknowledge it, I'm not talking about we're guilty of that. We just have to acknowledge it. We're not guilty of what our forefathers did. Ezekiel 18.20, the person who sins will die. The son will not be punished for the father's sins. And the father will not be punished for the, sins, the son's sins. The right and good man will receive good, and the simple man will suffer for his sin. I've never owned a slave. Y'all have never owned a slave. All we have to do is acknowledge, though, that this sin did affect this country, and we are feeling the after effects of it now. But simply admitting a problem exists doesn't even begin to correct it or to broach it. Second of all, we must search our own hearts. Here's that quote I was talking about. If only evil existed somewhere out there in the hearts of others, then we could easily separate those evil people from society and destroy them. But the line that separates good and evil runs through the heart of each and every man and woman. And who is willing to destroy a part of themselves? The only way the evil in our hearts is reined in is through the person of Jesus Christ. Through reading his word, through repenting of our sins, through confessing our sins and turning and going toward him, he transforms us. But each one of us could backslide at any given time. I know I've been guilty at times. I remember many years ago that uh, I grew up in a pretty secluded type of childhood. And there were certain groups of people I never dealt with much, and when I did, I didn't particularly care for them. There were people from India. And then when I went to Atlanta Christian College, God began to open my heart. He put an a, a 18 or 19-year-old girl who was from India in just about every class I took over that four-year period. And we got to be friends. And I, I, I think dearly of her. She was very mild and meek, and like I said, we got to be friends. And I heard her preach a few times, and then what got me was when she's very mild and meek in her daily life, but once she stepped behind the podium, she would bring it. Totally different culture. We discussed things such as arranged marriages because that's what she was in when she was going home. Her husband had already been decided on by both families. And she had some uh, reservations about it, but she went home and they are married and now they are leading a church there in Kerala. But God put her in my path to take that discrimination out of me, to show me we're all the same. Now, we can't change the past, and we can't change another person's heart, but we can change our own with the help of Jesus Christ. We have to acknowledge those things, and then we have to look inward, and then we have to begin to look outward. We have to work at changing systems within our government that 
encourage racism or things that undermine the family, things that threaten the lives of others. 1 John 4, 23-21 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. We must truly value one another. We must truly value others. Even those that don't look like us. Even those who don't sound like us. When I served at West Georgia with a ministry, some of the uh, girls that Teresa and I kind of adopted began to do international ministry with students who were there at West Georgia. And first these American girls came to our house for dinner and Teresa cooked dinner a few times. And then they said, well look, we would love to cook dinner for you but we don't have a place to do it. Can we cook dinner for y'all at your house? And Teresa's like, well yeah. And then pretty soon they said, well, can we bring some international students here? We would like them to see the way we live here in America. I thought that was the greatest compliment they ever paid me. And Teresa was that they wanted to bring guests into our home because they felt like it was their home as well. And we began to bring in international students. And pretty soon they said, well, y'all cooked dinner for us. Can we cook dinner for y'all? So one night it would be Indian night. And one night it would be um, Vietnamese night. And we, we had quite a variety of food that year. I took a group of these students one time on a field trip to Atlanta. We went to the Fox Theater and we toured the theater. And it was funny to see how different groups saw it differently. The South American students loved it. They, thought they loved the history of the Fox and of the Old South. The German students looked at it and went, the house I grew up in was older than this building. I don't see any big deal. Then we went down to Centennial Park. And the German students went to every single monument in that park looking for the names of the German athletes. The Colombian students just wanted to play soccer over here on the grass and picnic. The Asian students went across the street and picked up some takeout. But each group was different. But I learned to value each for who they were, each for their culture. I went on a rafting trip. It was our... This was a statewide trip from uh, all the students and all the campuses, and they brought international students together for a rafting trip. And I laid in my bed the first night, and the hotel had a, a breezeway, and all the students were out there, and I heard all these different languages being spoken. And I thought to myself, that must have been what it sounded like on the day of Pentecost, as each one heard the gospel preached in their own language. And that night when we got together in a, in a big hall, students stood up, they introduced themselves, and the girl sitting over here on my right was from Iraq, and the girl sitting on my left was a Swiss citizen. Now let me tell you her story real quick. Her parents left Vietnam when she was not, at, not even uh, five. Well, no, she wasn't even born, actually, now that I think about it. But her parents were Vietnamese, full-blooded Vietnamese, and they fled the war and they went through several countries, and they finally settled in Switzerland and got a permanent residency there. But yet when you looked at her, she is full-blooded Vietnamese. So when she stands up, she says, I'm from Switzerland. And the girl from Iraq says, well, she doesn't look Swiss. You see how these borders are all man-made and don't really matter? Because she was my sister in Christ, and the Iraqi next to me was my sister in Christ. And we get out on the river, and I'm doing pretty good with my crew. I'm the only guy in the boat, and I, I'm sitting at the back. I'm running the tiller, and I've made the girls do a few things to make the boat go this way and that way. So we had basic commands. You know, I could say right forward, left forward, right back, and we could do things. Well, there was one boat where no, there was no common language. And I think this is a great picture of our world when we don't cooperate across these ethnic and racial lines. This boat went all the way down the river in circles. They could not communicate to get everybody paddling. So finally I paddled over and the girl with the, at the tiller was German and she spoke, spoke broken English and I, I said, look, just do 
what I do and try to get everybody else in your boat to do what the others do. And for a while they did okay, and after a while we drifted away and lost them. And then we watched them come through some rapids backwards and sideways and then go swimming. That's what we're facing in our world if we can't come together and work across those racial lines. We'll be turned constantly on the waves and the rapids of life if we don't begin to truly value others. Now, with that said, I'm not going to, to jump into politics and blame one side or the other, but we have reforms we need to make in our country. I, and I support peaceful protest. I'm not saying we need to go out and protest. That's your call if you want to get involved in that. My fear is that the divides are run so deep today that there are those that slip into a peaceful protest and it becomes a riot. We also need to support our men and women in blue. Our police officers. Can you imagine that if we do away or if we continue to take our police and, and set them up for failure, how those who want to riot and pillage are going to create complete chaos? We need to support our police and we need to pray for them. You and I have no clue what they go through every day when they have to make a split-second decision. Could you imagine stopping a car out here on the highway, not knowing who's in it, and having to walk up and approach them and talk to them. And if you want to know a little bit more about what they face each and every day, call the local sheriff's department. They have a class called the Citizens Law Enforcement Academy. It's anywhere from six to 12 weeks, depending on the county. And I've, I've been through it, and it is an eye-opener. And there are times they will put you in front of a huge simulator, and you're going into a, a situation. The one I went into was a hospital shooting, and they give me a rifle, they gave my partner a pistol, and we know we're going into a hot situation. There are others where there are things like a, a police stop, where they pull over a car, and they pull the dad out, and he's got warrants. And so they're going to arrest him. It's just that clear. You're watching that on the screen, and you're the backup, and a 12-year-old pops out of the truck with a gun and says, you're not taking my daddy to jail. The training officer told me that every single officer fails that one to start with because nobody wants to point a gun at a child. And she comes out shooting after she says that. Citizens Law Enforcement Academy. But we have to value one another. Let me share one more story with you that illustrates the power of Jesus Christ. That trip to Hawaii I told you about, I flew over by myself and Teresa was coming a few days later. And I found myself sitting on a plane, and I, I do what I call reading in theater. I try to find some books that kind of tie in with where I'm traveling. It gives me a greater appreciation for where I'm going. And so I'm going to Hawaii. Of course, that's the home of Pearl Harbor. So I'm reading PT-109. We've gotten up in the air. Now, it's a nine-and-a-half-hour flight to Hawaii straight from Atlanta. So I've got several books. You have a couple meals, a movie. And the lady next to me, here again, I wasn't raised around a lot of Asians, so I didn't know what her nationality was. I just knew she was Asian. She said, what are you reading? She spoke very good English. I had some accent. I said, I'm reading PT-109, the story of John F. Kennedy's time in World War II. Oh, we love John F. Kennedy. I said, you, we? She said, yeah, I'm Korean. Now, she had relocated and lived in Rochester, New York. Her husband was an engineer and a contractor, and he was working in Japan at the time, and she was flying to Hawaii, and he was going to fly to Hawaii, and they were going to have a vacation together. And so in a nine-and-a-half-hour flight, we got to know each other a bit. We talked about the book. She began to ask me what I did, and I told her I was a minister, and she told me about her women's group back in Rochester, New York, and how her church did things. And So we got to know each other. We land in Hawaii. We're literally getting our bags out of the overhead. And she looks at me. Now, remember, her husband's in Japan. He's flying there. She says, my husband and I want to take you to dinner tonight. I've not met her husband. And see, on the way, we'd also talked about Korean barbecue and a buffet. And I said, sure. And we exchanged numbers. I said, I'll call you later. And when your husband's in, we'll meet at the restaurant. Now, I'm expecting a buffet like when you go to M&J or Golden Corral, but if you've ever, anybody here ever had Korean barbecue? 
it, when you go in, it's a buffet, but it looks more like the meat department at Kroger than it does anything at Golden Corral. Nothing's cooked. I meet them at the restaurant. They order, and we go down, and we're just pointing at things and putting it on our plate. It's all raw. Now, when you sit down at your table, there's a burner about this big in the middle, and you cook things as you're eating it. I have no clue what I'm doing, and it's obvious. I did pretty good with the chopsticks. That was about the only thing that I was complimented on. But we had a great meal. We broke bread together, or something that looked like bread anyway. The only thing I could identify on my plate was the octopus, because it's hard to not know what an octopus leg looks like. So we're eating, and the waitress is coming and going, and they're speaking to her in Korean. And evidently, they told her that I was a minister. And she looks and speaks to me in Korean, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I do not speak Korean. Of course, I said it real slow and loud, because that helps you understand, right? She looks at me, and in very, very broken English, she says, me, Christian, Our common faith crossed the racial barriers. Our common faith crossed the ethnic barriers. That's the only words the waitress and I were able to speak and share and understand. So how do we value others? We reach out. We reach out in a hundred or a thousand little ways each and every day. You do it by speaking to someone who doesn't look like you at the grocery store. Just in passing, not just the clerk, but in passing. We have to be intentional about it. Simple things. I watched a man with a handful of groceries trying to get a, a bouquet of flowers. This was a day after the race riots and the fires in Atlanta, and he's trying to get a bouquet of flowers for his wife, and he can't quite. I grabbed the bag for him and helped him put those in the bag. You know what he said? Thank you, brother. We do it by speaking. How are you? Can I help you with that? A thousand little ways each and every day. A simple hello, a thank you, you're welcome. We don't ignore. We have to have an attitude of serving one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. I hope and pray that we've heard these words today from God about favoritism and racism and how we serve one another. During the Civil War, one of uh, Abraham Lincoln's advisors said, Mr. President, I sure am glad that God's on our side. And Abraham Lincoln responded. He said, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is that we be on God's side. For God is always right. When we look another human being in the eye, we're looking at someone made in the image of the living God that we worship. No matter their skin tone, no matter their language, no matter their ethnicity or their race, I pray that we are all on God's side. One day each one of us will stand before God one day we'll see him face to face in all of his glory. And all of these differences that separate us in this world will seem to be such a trivial and distant thing in the past. One day we'll hear a multitude of languages singing out his praises. One day. One day. One day. Let's do our part to make that day today as far as how we get along with one another. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today here, brokenhearted over how we have treated one another. 
Lord, every person on the face of this earth is made in your image. May we never forget that. Father, we have judged one another based on outward appearances. We've discriminated against your creation based on where you chose for them to be born, for how you made them look. We've shown favoritism for those who have over those who have not. We've divided people up on their looks, their sound, their culture. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for that. Open our hearts that we would see others as you see them, as your sons and daughters. Father, help us to realize that we will never look upon another person. We will never look upon a person that you don't love. And Lord, help us to be your mouthpiece, your representative, your ambassador to bring healing in our country and our nation at this time. Amen. Thank you. 
I challenge you this week to go out and to reach out to someone who doesn't look like you in the name of Jesus Christ. If everybody in this country were to do that, we could take care of the problems we have. We could make the changes we need to make. But it has to start somewhere. Let it be with us. God bless you and have a great week. Love you all. Thank you to everybody at home for tuning in today, and we will see you back here at 3 o'clock today. God bless.